Hello, and welcome to Film Slam Screen's Pulse Film Conversation for Memorial. My name is Eric Seiler. I'm an instructor of film, media arts, and communications, as well as moderator for this conversation. We are very pleased to be joined by the director of Memorial, Ian Kelly. He's joining us from Chicago today. Hello, Ian, and welcome. Hi, Eric. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you. So um, this is a very uh, memorable film. And um, and there's a lot of good information in there about the film, which I didn't know, and I'm sure many viewers did not know. Did you? How did you come to learn this information, and how did you decide to actually make it into a film? Yeah. So my relatives on my mom's side of my family were steel workers um, at the beginning of the 1900s and, and through the 21st century. Um, 20th century. So this sort of steelworker history was something that was in, in my family, in my blood, and something that I became more and more interested in. Um, and so when I was moving to Chicago, I know that Chicago was a big labor city um, and has some really important labor history, particularly with regards to steelworkers. So it wasn't an event that I knew about, though, until I moved here and I started to learn more about local Chicago labor and steel history. Um, then once you start learning about it, it's it's so striking. But things really clicked for me when I heard that this the massacre was filmed. Um, and I so I sought out that footage and I wanted to see, you know, what that actually looked like. It's such a rare thing. Um, that an event like this from this period of time, um, the late 30s, something that happens spontaneously would be filmed like this. We're so accustomed to um, nowadays that you know this violence is captured on film. At, at this time, it's so rare. So when I saw that footage for the first time, um, it's so affecting. It, it really shook me um, and moved me and reminded me so much of images that we, I, I saw this footage for the first time, I think in early 2021. So it's not long after the, the protests against police violence in 2020. And I was struck by how similar um, this image looked from a century ago uh, to what we were seeing now, um, these images of state violence against working class people um, really, looking like not a lot has changed in a lot of ways. And um, that's something I wanted to understand more about. Um, and that's when I started deciding I wanted to make this film. Yeah. Well, interesting. So how did you find this footage? Did you see it on the internet or? Yeah, so it's available. I found it online. Um, it's after doing a little digging, you can find it in different places. Um, it was available through different some YouTube channels of some like really old versions of it. Um, and some some had there's a lot of different versions of the footage that exists out there. Um, it's actually a wonderful resource if people want to know more about this event. Um, the South, Southeast Chicago Historical Society, um, they have a wonderful website uh, that has a really great interactive piece uh, made by Christine Wally um, that that gives more sort of like in depth um, information, very in informative and educational about this event. Um, and since I thought that there were a lot of good resources out there that tell us, you know, really sort of the context and, and strong history of why this happened, I thought that that wasn't necessarily the story I needed to tell, but I wanted to consider, maybe consider this more artistically, consider it as this sort of historical memory. Um, and what does it mean as a memory? Um, and how could this sort of be told and interpreted in a different way um, using sort of my strengths as an artist, as an animator? And what can we consider about uh, sort of what is lost over time or, or the way that memory sort of distorts this or, or reshapes this? Um, and so that's why I took the, the particular approach that I took to the film. All right, so yes, you, you mentioned you have a background in animation. So it's natural for you to have animation combined with the footage in this film. Mm -hmm. Why did you choose this approach? Did you ever consider a different approach such as trying to track down descendants of people who were at mm -hmm. the protests and doing interviews and so forth? 
talk to us a little bit about this specific approach you took with this film. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I knew I wanted to use animation um, because I think that I think that animation is a really great tool for telling these historical stories, stories about memory, um, because history and memory is is sort of imperfect and it's it can be subjective. It has omissions, and I think that animation as a mode, as a medium, it shares a lot of those things in common. You know, animation is sort of like constantly in motion and it's sort of inexact. And I think that that sort of mirrors some of uh, the qualities of memory. So I think they fit together in a really nice way. As far as the actual sort of content of the film and how that would translate into the animation, um, I did, I, I went through a bunch of different ideas about how that would actually work. Um, from the beginning, I had that piece of oral history that George Patterson shares. Um, and, and that I found to be a really, really, at least two documents, right? The, um, the oral history from George Patterson and the actual footage of the massacre. And I knew I wanted those things to really um, be sort of the core structurally of the film because they're both really emotional, interesting, um, intense, sort of first person artifacts. Um, but but I went through a bunch of different ways of piecing those things together um, while making the film, you know, things that didn't end up in the film. I, I interviewed um, Bill Bork, who was the person who recorded the oral history with George Patterson. So initially I, I talked to him and he has done a lot of research on the massacre and he had lots of really interesting things to say. And it was interesting to hear his perspective as the person who originally recorded the George Patterson oral history. Um, but in the end, it felt like the, the thing that the film was really asking of me was to sit with the artifacts, the, the footage and that oral history, um, and to not go too far out of that world, right? To sort of bring us closely into that um, and encourage our audience to engage closely with it um, and really take time to look at this thing and, and consider it in new ways. Part of the idea to show the archival footage like I did, um, to show it and then show it again and then slow it down and show it uh, another time really, really slow, almost like one frame per second. Um, was the idea that I think we get comfortable looking at archival footage, seeing it as something that's at a distance, um, and particularly archival footage of violence, I think loses um, the quality that it's real, right? And so I wanted to try to figure out a method um, to encourage people to really have to sit with it and maybe get a little uncomfortable with it. Um, and slowing it down was my attempt at that. And, you know, hopefully it's successful in getting people to consider the fact that what they're looking at, it happened a long time ago, but it, it actually wasn't that long ago. And we're still living with a lot of the same conditions that are present there. Um, and that that was a real event that really happened. And you're looking at, at a document that shows what it was like to be there in a lot of ways. So as a filmmaker, are you able to give us your position on the events that unfolded or are you strictly sticking to, I'm a filmmaker, I'm just putting out my work? No, I, um, my feeling about being a documentary filmmaker um, is that I, I, don't, I don't really see that as, um, <laughs> as something that necessarily uh, makes me, I think that all filmmaking is subjective. And I think that particularly with documentary filmmaking, um, if, you're, if you're trying to be objective, you're ignoring the fact that you're the one who's telling a story, you're shaping it. Um, and so I have no qualms about saying that, you know, the reason why I wanted to make this film and show this was because I thought that this was an abhorrent um, injustice by the police, um, by the Chicago police, who committed egregious acts of violence then, and, and they've committed egregious acts of violence throughout the, the hundred years since that event. And the, one of the main reasons why I wanted to show this is because police violence um, is an epidemic in this country today, um, and labor movements continue to be oppressed and suppressed, um, and those things change, right? Um, 
in different ways. The labor movement has certainly uh, gained a lot of legal protections since um, 1937. Um, and police violence looks differently, frankly. Um, in this video, one difference that we see between police violence then and now is that they're, all, they're shooting at a crowd of largely white Americans and largely actually white immigrants here. Um, and today, as we know, obviously, that police violence is overwhelmingly against black and brown people in this country. Um, and so I wanted to sort of point out the long legacy of state violence and particularly state violence against working class people, uh, but also understand that that changes and it's not exactly the same thing, but it's, it's sort of a lineage that leads to where we are today. So it's interesting how you drew that excellent connection between this past event and current events as well. As you have screened this film throughout festivals, has your audience been able to make that connection? And if so, um, share some of the, share share with us some of the, their reactions and responses. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I've been lucky to share uh, this in a number of other festivals um, since it uh, got to screen with Film Slam which is one of the first festivals that it got to screen with, which is very exciting and I'm, I'm forever grateful of that. Um, you know, I think that audiences have really resonated with the piece. Um, I got to share it locally in Chicago, which was very exciting. And, and I think here people really appreciated um, uh, this one. I think people got to learn about a piece of history that they didn't necessarily know. And uh, I think people also felt um, that they had an experience of seeing, oh, look, yeah, it's the Chicago PD and um, it's 100 years ago and they're acting in, in the same way as we sort of expect them to act now. Um, and so I think that people have made those connections and that's exciting to see. And I think people have learned something new about history, um, something about labor history in particular that I think is a lot of people are, are really excited about now. Um, I know a lot of people um, in my generation, younger and Gen Z people are really excited about labor activism now. And I think it's important um, for people in sort of the new young labor movements to be looking at this history, um, this sort of really violent history at the beginning of the 1900s um, that allowed for these big gains in organizing and collective bargaining to be made. Um, that today uh, we have strong unions and and well we're trying to have strong unions again um and there it was it was a really violent struggle to get that uh to the place that it got to and so i think people are really excited about uh labor right now and organizing it's good to know that history too well i've seen i've seen this film you know a few times and um one thing I just can't get over is as I'm watching it, I'm just thinking, what is the person who's filming this thinking? What are the people who are there? What are they thinking? And of course, way people think back in the 1930s as opposed to today are different. So did you ask yourself that same question? Yeah. You know, what do you think they were thinking at the time? Of course. I know. Um, you know, I of course, yeah, I asked that question too. Um, and you have, and I think in a lot of ways, we don't know the answer. Um, mm -hmm. The person who filmed this actually testified in Congress about, um, uh, his name was Otto, and I forget his last name now, um, but he testified in Congress about this, about filming this. Um, I forget if he was asked about sort of his subjective take on this, but one thing that I can say is that when when this was when this film was released um, or what this newsreel right was made, it was going to be shown in Chicago and uh, Chicago police, the local government, I sort of forget who was at the forefront of this stopped the screening because they were afraid of people seeing this footage um, and and that sort of, and people rioting over it, right? As they rightly would, right? Um, and so there was a lot of attempts to censor this footage um, after it was it was released, but um, it was also used in Congress. Um, there was a congressional investigation into this event uh, called the La Follette Committee. And 
this was actually um, the first, I believe, the first piece of footage ever used, piece of film footage ever used as evidence in a case like this. Um, and it, the record is that it was incredibly compelling um, to the congressional committee um, to see this. They watched it a number of different times. Um, they, they actually did a similar thing to what I do in the film. They slowed it down and they sort of looked at it frame by frame, which I think is really interesting. Um, and it, and the committee agreed overwhelmingly that the violence by the police was avoidable, but no police were ever prosecuted for uh, the killings. So, you know, the, the congressional opinion was that the police are responsible, but no one was held responsible. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you for informing us about that. I did not know this uh, additional um, history connected to the film at all. So um, I was, um, tell us about some other projects are you, that you're working on now or things yeah. that we can expect to see from you. Yeah, I'm working on another film now um, that in some ways has some thematic connections to this film. Um, I mentioned my family um, at the beginning, uh, my relatives being steel workers. Um, I'm working on a film right now that's about um, collective memory in the town where my grandfather lost his memory. So my grandfather had Alzheimer's. Um, he, he lived with it for about a decade and um, he lost his memory and he, he had lived in this community his whole life, the community of steel workers, working class people in Western Pennsylvania. So this film that I'm working on now is it's an animated portrait. Um, I returned to my grandfather's hometown and um, I consider the memory of the community and his own memory loss and, and sort of the memory loss presence in my family and in this community. Um, and it also sort of considers uh, the deindustrialization of the steel community and how that is itself sort of a form of memory loss. Oh, interesting, interesting. Carrying along that line, you are pro um, steel workers and yeah. uh, <laughs> labor. Pro labor, uh, yeah. Exactly. That that's that's really great that you can um, do that. Especially, I uh, take this is a local. This is a local project as well, too. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, this is great. Well, this is really good. I enjoyed the time that you spent with us and um, and giving us some additional insight on this film. It's really great to uh, know that. And it's always, you know, I I know we spoke before and each time I speak to you, I'm always learning something. As well. <laughs> and I know I asked this before, but I just want to ask this again, the, uh, the title of the film. Um, explain to us why you gave that title yeah. and you know, the whole explanation behind that before I let you go. <laughs> yeah, of course. And I see that there's a question in the chat here that I'll respond to as well. Um, the, the idea behind the title was, um, you know, this, this idea of Memorial, um, Memorial Day, this, this, this sort of strange, um, I don't know, s s uh, symbolism of the fact that this event uh, that, that is in need of remembering and memorializing happened on Memorial Day um, was just this sort of strange double meaning. And so I was thinking about double meanings and when things are sort of present and not present at the same time. So I was sort of using that um, idea of the parenthetical uh, um, to sort of say that there, this is the memorial and this is also the memory. So it's it's the, the two things at the same time, Memorial Day and this massacre. Um, yeah, so that's the idea. <laughs> um, and then I see that there's this question in the chat. Um, are there recommendations I have for students interested in learning or pursuing animation in filmmaking? Absolutely. Um, I can say that, um, well, I'll say two things actually for um, I'll plug that I got a great education I, I, nearby uh, Cleveland I in Northeast Ohio I, I learned I went to Oberlin College and I'm proud to have gotten my education in Northeast Ohio where um, I learned a lot about filmmaking and animation um, and so there, that was just a, a wonderful place. And I worked with wonderful people like Ryan Brown Orso, who is a Northeastern Oak 
Ohio resident, and she taught me a lot about animation, experimental animation. And then as along with that, um, a really accessible tool is, um, well, I guess it used to be called LinkedIn or lynda.com, and now I think it's LinkedIn Learning, but it's um, tutorials online um, and you get access to them uh, through a public library, library card, a really extensive array of uh, tutorials. And I learned a ton, a ton of the technical stuff that I know how to do from these free online tutorials from my public library card. And so big plug for public libraries and um, their resources. Uh, that's where I learned a lot, a lot of what I know how to do. Uh, absolutely. Our libraries are amazing, amazing. Well, Ian, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. I wish you all the best and we look forward to seeing more work from you. Thank you so much, Eric. It was really wonderful to be here. All the best. And thank you to our audience for joining us for this important and invigorating conversation. For more information about upcoming film festivals and CIF events, please visit us at clevelandfilm.org. I'm Eric Seiler. Thank you.